Welcome to Law Sessions. I'm Jennifer Hausen. In this law session on English legal systems, we will be looking at the judiciary. Now, there is in a separate law session, we looked at the courts. Now we're looking at the hierarchy as it relates to the judges who sit in England and Wales. And we will basically look at who these people are, what their functions are, and what the issues are in relation to the judiciary. Now, when you look at judges in England and Wales, in 1970, it numbered somewhere around 300 judges in England and Wales. What we have seen, though, is that some 30 years or so later, you're looking at about three and a half thousand judges, mostly part time. Now, that's not to say, well, the workload went from being 300 to 3,500. What you will see is that there has been a change and not least you see where before you had uh, persons like stipendary magistrates who are now considered district judges. We see that there has been uh, more use of uh, recorders uh, and I'll explain what that means later on. But the idea is that when you look at the judiciary in England and Wales, you have your full-time judges who are appointed after a possible period of part-time service. And then, of course, you have a huge side of uh, part-time judges uh, generally. Now, the Lord Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary and has been since 2004. Now, there are four heads of divisions. You have the Master of the Rolls, you have the President of the Queen's Bench Division, you have the President of the Family Division, and of course, the Chancellor of the High Court. Now, the Master of the Rolls is the head of the Civil Division of the Court of Appeal. The other heads are in charge of the three divisions of the High Court. Now, the judges are at the very center of any legal system as they are the ones who sit in the courts and decide the cases. So we could say here, well, you've got the Supreme Court, we have the Court of Appeal, we have the High Court, but who are the judges who sit there? You need the judges because it is certainly uh, from the judges that we get the decisions which then form these binding precedents that we talk about. Now, as I said, at the head, you have the president of the courts of England and Wales. Now, this particular position was created by the Constitutional Reform Act in 2005. And under Section 7 of the Act, the president's role is to represent the views of the judiciary to parliament and to government ministers. Now, he or she is also responsible to, ma uh, uh, to maintain the appropriate arrangements for the welfare, the training, and the guidance of the judiciary and also to arrange where judges work as well as their workload. Now the most senior judges of course are the 12 law lords who are the lords of appeals in ordinary. Now they previously sat in the house of lords and of course the privy council but their role changed however since the government decided to abolish the house of lords and of course to, repla to replace it with the Supreme Court, which of course was established and started operations around 2009. Now, under the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, this is where of course we see these vast changes. Now, sitting in the Court of Appeal, we have about 37 judges. They're known as Lord Justices of Appeal and also Lady Justices of, of Appeal. Now, the Criminal Division of the Court of Appeal is presided over by the Lord Chief Justice, who following the 2005 Reform Act, uh, became the president of the courts of England and Wales. He or she can at the same time act as the head of the criminal justice or appoint another Court of Appeal judge to take this role. The civil division of the Court of Appeal is presided over by the Master of the Rolls, and when we look at the High Court, we have about 107 full-time judges, as well as sitting in uh, the High Court itself, they hear most serious, the more serious uh, criminal cases in the Crown Court. Although, uh, similarly to judges in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, High Court judges receive a knighthood, they are referred to as Mr. or Mrs. Justice Smith, for example, and it is written Smith J. Now, 
Below that rank, of course, we then get our circuit judges. Circuit judges are those who travel around Britain, sitting in the county court and also hearing uh, middle-ranking type Crown Court cases. Now, under the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994, it added a further role and it allowed them to occasionally sit in the criminal division of the Court of Appeal. Now, the slightly less serious Crown Court criminal cases are heard by district judges and, of course, there are recorders who are part-time judges dealing with the least serious Crown Court criminal cases. Now, recorders are usually uh, still working as barristers or solicitors and the role is often used as a kind of apprenticeship before becoming a circuit judge. So you get your recorder who um, is more, more or less sort of an apprentice judge, uh, but he's a little bit more than that. It is, it is because he's still maintaining his private practice as a lawyer. Now, the volume of minor cases coming before the Crown Court does require there being, uh, you know, more uh, people dealing with it. Now, you had assistant recorders, but by and large, you don't really have the assistance recorders anymore. They've all become recorders. Now, in larger cities, you have district judges. Now, you have district judges who sit in the county court and you have district judges who sit in the magistrate's court because you had various types of um, uh, judges as it relates to those who are sitting in the county court, those who are sitting in the magistrate's courts as stipendary magistrates. I'm not talking about uh, uh, magistrates here who are justices, who are lay people. You can have a, a stipendary magistrate sitting who is a, a qualified person. Now, nowadays, when you look at district judges, we see that uh, these were previously stipendary judges and they are full-time legally qualified judges working in the magistrate's court. Now, you do need some background when you look at the whole area of judges in the UK. Now, when you look at uh, the, the history, previously it was possible for the Lord Chancellor to be in the House of Lords, the court itself, or the Privy Council. But what we have seen in recent times is that the Lord Chancellors have only chosen to maybe do this occasionally, if at all. Now, in his political role, the Lord Chancellor had been a cabinet minister, speaker of the House of Lords. He was straddling all three of the uh, organs of the state. Now, although technically uh, he's appointed by the Queen, the Lord Chancellor is actually chosen by the Prime Minister and goes out of office when the party loses an election as well as being eligible for removal by the Prime Minister, just like any other minister. In relation to its executive functions, the Lord Chancellor was the head of the Lord Chancellor's department. That is no more, of course, it's now the Department of Constitutional Affairs. He had powers to give directions about the business of the courts, responsibility for the Law Commission, state funding of legal services, and most controversially, he had control over judicial appointments. Now, politically, the most important judicial appointment is that, is that, is that of course, of the Master of the Rolls. As President of Court of, of Appeal, of course, his view on the proper relationship between the executive, the government, and the individual is crucial. Now, when we look at the conflicting role of the Lord Chancellor and the fact that it raised extraordinary concerns uh, not least because when you look at the Lord Chancellor's role, it did give some rise for concern. Now, by about uh, June 2003, we see the government announcing that it intended to abolish the office of the Lord Chancellor and instead to establish a Minister for Constitutional Affairs with significantly fewer powers than the Lord Chancellor had before. And that really was a necessity because when you look at the role of the Lord Chancellor, if anything went against, uh, or if there was ever an argument as it relates to the separation of powers, it certainly was the role of the Lord Chancellor. He was straddling all three organs and it certainly caused problems. The Constitutional Reform Act of 2009 
made changes in relation to the Lord Chancellor, and it made four major changes to his role. One, he could no longer sit as a judge. Two, he could no longer head the judiciary. Three, he could no longer take a central role in the judicial appointment process. And four, he was no longer automatically able to become the Speaker of the House. What he retains, though, is that he remains the head of the government department, which is, of course, now the DCA or the Department of Constitutional Affairs. Now, we see that it has become more a traditional cabinet role, as it were, and we see that there is the new position of the President of the Court of England and Wales being created, and we see that that is taken out of his remit. So, by and large, we see that when you look at the Constitutional Reform Act, it has provided certainty and clarity. Now, in the past, the Lord Chancellor had to be a lawyer. But under Section 2 of the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, the Lord Chancellor must simply appear to the Prime Minister to be qualified by experience. And subsection 2 further goes on to say that this experience could have been gained as a government minister, a member of either House of Parliament, a qualified lawyer, teacher of law in a university, or other experience that the Prime Minister considers relevant. So when you look at the Lord Chancellor uh, today, it is a uh, more improved role, if you like, a clearer role, one that does not give rise for concern as it relates to the separation of powers. So that gives you some idea as to the changes which have occurred. Certainly, this forms or uh, what appears to be something of constitutional importance and arguably any discussion that you will have, especially in relation to the United Kingdom's, Kingdom's constitution, please bear in mind that the role of the judges is very important and therefore having the knowledge of the background is indeed helpful. What I want us to do now though is to consider an overview of the judges within England and Wales and to also continue further in looking at uh, how judges are appointed and indeed uh, what the issues have been and have become over time in relation to judges. Uh, we will take a short break and immediately on my return I will certainly discuss uh, the, the different types of judges that we have within this jurisdiction.